My name is Danuka Gunaratna, um, and I work uh, at CAGS and, um, you know, really excited to welcome you. So it is essential that uh, we respectfully acknowledge the lands that we are joining from. So again, um, if you are interested, please share where you're joining us from in the chat. Uh, so I want to recognize and acknowledge that this symposium is being hosted virtually from the city of Ottawa, uh, which is built on the unceded Algon. Quinn Anishinaabe territory. Uh, CAGS and those gathered here today um, honor all First Nations, Inuit, Métis people, uh, and their valuable past and present contributions. Uh, with that being said, I also want to acknowledge that personally, I am an uninvited guest and settler from the island of Sri Lanka, uh, now um, living on Turtle Island. Um, specifically today, I am, you know, I live, work, and learn from the traditional territories of the Anish, um, Anishinaabe, Atwandran, Hidnasonius people uh, here in Waterloo, Ontario, where I'm located. So um, I continue to learn um, and unlearn um, all the, the things in the history and the past uh, of this country. And, uh, you know, uh, I'm really grateful to be able to um, work, play, and reap the benefits of uh, some of the past, um, you know, atrocities we've we've seen uh, that is a part of this land um, and its history. So that is all rooted in racism. Um, so that being said, I would like to turn things over to our series producer and host, Dr. Evelyn Astadu, originally from Brampton, Ontario. Dr. Astadu received her Bachelor of Science degree from Western University in 2013 and earned her PhD from the University of Alberta uh, in 2021. She's currently complete, uh, completing a postdoctoral fellowship with Environment and Climate Change Canada. Her volunteer activities have centered around environmental sustainability, uh, community building, and promotion of diversity in science. So with that being said, I will pass the virtual mic over to you, Evelyn. Thank you so much, Danuka. Everybody can hear me fine? Yes, great. Okay, thank you again for that introduction, Danuka. And Welcome to everybody, or welcome back to The Good and the Bad of Black Grad, where I speak to panelists from all over Canada um, about their experiences. And so uh, today our topic is uh, Black Don't Crack, question mark, triple question marks. Um, the, the blessings and blues of uh, Black Graduate School are the experience and the the goal of today is to speak with our panelists about the joys and challenges of what it's like to to be a graduate student or a black graduate student today. And before we get into things, I would like to acknowledge our sponsors. We have two major sponsors from the University, University of Alberta who would like to thank. Um, this episode is brought, brought to you by the Intersections of Gender, which is a signature research area at the University of Alberta. And the Intersections of Gender supports and promotes intersectional research and research design for faculty and students across the campus. And also, uh, I'd like to thank Professor Shirley Ann Tate. Um, Dr. Shirley Ann Tate is a Canada Research Chair, Tier 1 in Feminism and Intersectionality from the Sociology Department at University of Alberta. And she's also an honorary professor of Nelson Mandela University. Her research is in Black Diaspora Studies and focuses on Caribbean decol decolonial theory. And she publishes on institutional racism, the body, beauty, race, performativity, and hybridity. Um, of blackness. So uh, she also provided support through her CRC chair. And so thank you to both of our sponsors. And um, just a reminder again, I do every episode that um, our panelists here are joined um, and are um, here to, to be honest and they're representing themselves. And um, I'm so thankful for that. Um, and we're, we hope to have a meaningful and engaging discussion. And so um, feel free to as Danuka mentioned, uh, pop your questions into the Q&A. Um, that being said, anything, any kind of questions that are um, hateful or harmful will be ignored. Um, we don't tolerate hate speech here. Um, and anybody espousing such opinions will be removed from the room. So with that being said, let's get into it. Uh, give a little round table of our, our lovely panelists here. Um, we have Tari Ajadi, who's a PhD student from Dalhousie University. How are you feeling today, Tari? Mm -hmm. Oh, well, you know, I'm surviving. <laughs> That's the surviving. main thing. I'm doing good, thanks. Thank you. Thank thanks you for, for being here. 
Uh, we also have Jamila Desharp, who is also a, a PhD student. She's at Concordia University, from reporting from Montreal, Quebec. Uh, how are we doing, Jamila? I am also surviving, okay. and I'm here, so I feel like I'm kind of thriving or trying to thrive. You will. You will. I feel like this, is being, <laughs> this will be a good conversation. So, I mean, thank you for being here. I appreciate it. Um, welcome. And lastly, we have Sean Hercules, who's a PhD candidate uh, from McMaster University, reporting from Hamilton, Ontario. Sean, how are you? I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful. hopeful. Yeah. I love that. I love that. Okay, yeah. good. We need we need some positive positive energy here. We need to bring us all up today. So thank you all again for being here, um, our lovely panelists. I'm going to actually ask um, Ellie to pop in the first poll question, which is just basically trying to get an idea of who else is in the room, the audience members. So um, we've previously had attendees from far and wide and just really want to get an idea of um, who's here. So our panelists have a, a better idea of how to tailor their answers. So we'll just give a few moments um, for you guys to fill that out. It's a bit more of an intimate room today, but I think that that sometimes can be good, less intimidating. Okay, most people here are graduate students. Oh my God, that's almost never happened. Welcome, welcome. It's an uh, even split, almost even. Graduate students, um, and then we have some administrators, postdocs, faculty members, undergrads, and general audience members. Thank you guys also so much for being here. This is this is wonderful. And so we'll, we'll just get right into it. The first thing I like to do typically is um, get an idea of, of uh, a sense of who our, our panelists are. So the first question um, is, why did you choose grad school? So I'll start with Sean, your mic is unmuted. So I'll start with you. <laughs> why grad school? Um, yeah, so I chose grad school. So I have a, I did my master's before this and I chose that um, specifically because I, so I did a master of public health after my undergrad in biochemistry and chemistry. And I switched fields because I felt like hard, like hard science, quote unquote, was very, it just felt very small scale and I wanted to do bigger scale. Um, and public health masters was the perfect thing yeah. for me. Um, and then I chose the PhD program in biology um, because it, well, my specific, um, degree um, is allowing me to merge the science with the public health. So um, that's why I chose grad school and also to help my community. So I wasn't planning on doing a PhD, but I randomly met my supervisor um, in Barbados. And after talking about the project, I was like, okay, I definitely want to do this because it's going to impact my community. So that's why I chose grad school. That's really lovely. Thank you so much, Sean. Yeah, it's kind of serendipitous how things happen sometimes, like meeting a researcher in Barbados. I mean, that you're from Barbados, but I would love to have been that person to have met you in a warm and beautiful country. Uh, thanks for that. Uh, how about you, Tari? How, um, why did you decide to, to do grad school? So uh, when I was making the decision to actually be in grad school, I was working um, in politics, actually. I was working as a staffer for a politician. And I was really just looking for a way to kind of like broaden my understanding and my kind of skill set so that maybe I could return or maybe I could make a career transition into doing policy work. But I just wanted to kind of get to know and understand the field that I was working in in a little bit more depth. So that's why I did a master's. I ended up doing a one-year master's. And I enjoyed the things I was studying so much. So I continued on to do a PhD. I just went straight through. So that's, mm -hmm. that's pretty much it for me. Very cool. Very cool. Yeah. I mean, it's good. I often do encourage people to, if they want to do grad school, study something that is they're passionate about or something that that's important to them. So it sounds like that's exactly what you did. So thanks, Tari. And lastly, Jamila, tell us what brought you to grad school? Yes. Um, so in my third year of university, I started to become really dedicated to sociological research and so I wanted to pursue my sociological research as well as teaching but interestingly to be in a place where I was able to engage with the community and share and relay their needs to a body to institutions who could actually affect and create the change so I saw doing my PhD as creating this really amazing mediator position between the community and policy and institutions. So it's like this advocacy as well as teaching and research uh, position. And so, yeah. 
Very That's cool. cool. Yeah, lovely. Okay, I'm going to transition directly into getting to know a little bit more about exactly what you do. Um, so if you can give us like a, an elevator pitch, a couple sentences about your work, uh, let the audience know what you do. Yeah, so I can give a little elevator pitch of my research. So I'm doing my PhD project is a documentary on the ways that Black men and Black women innovate and empower Canadian the Canadian social fabric. Um, and it is a Black masculinity project, but at the same time, it's also to invigorate the ways that Black men and women work in cohesion to elevate each other. And it's being done as a documentary to to counter the news media of that regressive image of Black men and peoples as criminal, deviant, and all that stuff. And when we talk about Black people and Black communities, we so often focus on the gaps and the disadvantages and the marginalization, which is real. But I really wanted to do an empowerment project and really find the Black men in Canada, what they're doing, who they are, share their experiences, and really invigorate social sciences that way. Wow, that's beautiful. Very relevant work and very timely. So thank you for the work that you do. Um, we'll go backwards and I'll, I'll ask uh, Tari, um, what do you study? What do you bring into the table? Right. So my research looks at the tactics and the mobilizing discourses that Black activists use uh, to prompt policy change in public health and policing, both here in Halifax, Nova Scotia, and also I'll be doing some research in London, Ontario. So that's kind of my little uh, dissertation research. But broadly speaking, I look at kind of how Black activists organize and prompt policy change by engaging with policymakers, by engaging with community members, and sometimes by taking to the streets as well. Yeah, awesome. And it sounds like that's you do all of those things. We spoke about it last in, in our conversation, and I hope we can touch on that in a little bit. Um, we'll go over to uh, Sean, who's going to tell us what he does. Thank yeah. you. So for my research, I am investigating why, essentially why Black women are diagnosed with a more aggressive form of breast cancer um, than Caucasian American women. So um, I traveled to Nigeria, Jamaica, and Barbados, where I'm from, um, to collect data and also to, to, um, to collect clinical data and um, breast cancer tissues. Um, so my project is really looking at the trends, like the disease trends for breast cancer, as well as the genetic profile. So I, I sequence their DNA and looking for mutations that might be particularly useful for women of African ancestry with triple negative breast cancer. So wow. That's what we do. Very cool. Yeah. Very cool. Um, and, and it's interesting and, and, um, important that all of you are doing research which impacts um, the black community uh, and or how the black community is perceived and that is like I said important but also I imagine um, at times emotionally taxing and of course we're talking about that today we're talking about you know what what is that mental health and what is that emotional work that goes into um, or that comes with, I should say, being a graduate student. So um, I don't know what that's been like for you, Sean, um, studying breast cancer in, in Black women. Um, how did, is there a way that you separate that emotional work from your, from your research? Or in, and if so, tell us how, or maybe there isn't. Yeah, it's very hard to do that. Um, maybe in my first year, it would have been easier because I wasn't like I didn't really, like you never really understand your PhD project until comps. Well, for me at least. <laughs> for everybody. It's, it's really when comps said, I was like, okay, cool. Now I understand what I'm supposed to, I understand the assignment. Um, so um, it wasn't easy though, um, for sure to separate the two because um, in addition to what we do in the lab, we also do a lot of community outreach. So we partner our lab I'm in Dr. Juliet Daniels' lab, and we partner with um, community outreach groups in Ontario, so mostly Toronto and Hamilton. Mm -hmm. And we would do breast cancer workshops all the time with our community, like spreading, um, disseminating our results and, and getting feedback from the community as well about what they think, you know, is important for us to 
research, et cetera. So there was really, really never a true separation um, of my research and my outside life, really. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah, there wasn't really a distinct separation. And it, you know, got a little complicated as, you know, time went on and I actually knew um, like relatives and people in my circle that were diagnosed with this form of breast cancer. So it like directly, um, it was directly impactful mm -hmm. uh, at the same time. So it definitely wasn't easy. I don't know if it has gotten easier or if I've just accepted this is what it is and yeah. <laughs> did what I had to do. Yeah. Wow. Well, thank you for, for sticking to it and being, being so dedicated. Um, it, it hits different when it becomes super personal, I imagine. So yeah. Um, yeah, you're, you're coming to the end of your PhD. Congratulations. And um, I'm sure that that's, this taught you a lot of lessons moving forward in, in your career. Um, yeah. so thank you. Um, Jamila, how about you? Same question. Is there a way to separate it? Have you managed that? And just talk a little bit more. I would say where I'm concerned, I, I don't feel like it's possible to separate the two especially with the mainstreaming of the BLM movements and this call for me from you know colleagues and others to mobilize against systemic racism to give workshops to give talks and do all this work I'm talking about you know the black community a community I identify with the community that my family is a part of and I think I've been really dabbling and leading a lot of decolonial pedagogy work and this is really to deconstruct white supremacy and deconstruct that objective view that feelings are not supposed to be a part of activist work or a part of you know critical research or a part of uh, the academic sphere, mm -hmm. and so that's been really helping me because I've been I've been leading and founded and co-founded the Decolonial Perspectives and Practice Hub, and so I've been actually in all of my work trying to demonstrate to everybody I talk to that this is me, this this research applies to me, and when I come to the space to talk to you about it. We need to make that room for the emotional labor of not only me, but other BIPOC communities who are being called. Mm -hmm. and what does that mean? How do allies, how can allies or co-conspirators, you know, really, I don't want to say make that space again, but truly make that space mm -hmm. and be, be more of a support. Uh, so no, it, it's completely intertwined and I don't think that's a problem. I think it's actually powerful, you know, to take that stance, let your emotions drive your work sometimes. Absolutely. Yeah. Very well said. Very well said. Um, I won't, I won't big you up too much because Tari still has to go. So <laughs> he now has to follow that. So we'll just ask him how he's managed. <laughs> I mean, I'm literally doing an autoethnography where I incorporate my perspectives into my dissertation work. <laughs> so the separation is nil. So, you know, I, I don't know that, I don't know that I've ever managed it, but I think that kind of coming to where I've come to in my work and the unconventional ways that I show up in my research um, was a journey, right? I had to understand that the ways that I'd been trained to write the ways that I've been trained to think ne didn't necessarily correspond to what I perceived was needed within the context of my discipline, what I perceived was needed um, in terms of my work as a scholar. And also it, it, it also became the separation of priorities, right? And my, my, my primary priority, my primary responsibility, I believe is to my community and to my communities mm -hmm. and not necessarily to the academy. So mm -hmm. actually it was, it, it's, it's been this thing where it's like less so how do I separate my research um, from kind of broadly speaking, my community work to how do I make sure that my research is supporting my community mm -hmm. work? Because yeah. that's where I, yeah. I find the strength and the passion. Wow. Wow. Yeah. So for you, it's, uh, I mean, I'm sure all, all of what you've said and it relates to what, you know, Sean has said and Jamila has said, but for you, it's more of um, reframing the way that you're, you're looking at it. It's not so much, it, it's never been really a question of separation, as you said, <laughs> it's impossible. So, you know, how do you get to your end goal and, and use your emotion in, in a positive way? So, yeah, thank you guys all so much um, for, for that response. I'm going to go back to, to Jamila. Um, and she, you have mentioned that you had started a few different initiatives. You mentioned one in your last response um, about pedagogy, but um, there's a bigger initiative, which 
uh, is a national Black graduate student network. Um, could you talk a little bit more about that? Um, and as it relates to perhaps mental health, um, I think that'd be good, interesting to hear. Yeah, for sure. So the National Black Graduate Network, it was founded, it launched in 2020, but the idea came about in 2019 with a whole team. Uh, I went to Congress, 2019 Congress in Vancouver and connected with the Black Canadian Studies Association, became a student representative and just introduced to a world of just inspiring mentors, faculty, uh, and non-faculty. And, and we were just discussing the Black graduate student experience, especially in the wake of one of our members who was discriminated against at the Congress 2019. And, and some of you might know the incident. And so it was one of the many reminders given the fact as well how I, as a Black graduate student and a Black student throughout my academic career have always felt just kind of silenced, ostracized, can't see myself in my work. And as we were having that meeting with uh, the rest of the BCSA team, we all talked about sharing the same experiences when they were in grad school, when they weren't. And just the idea of the fact that there are so many Black graduate students in Canada feeling the same way and there are a lack of resources there is solidarity, there are efforts. We are not the first people to do this. There are efforts by black students all over Canada, but there's no interconnected communication between the two. There are vigorous scholars and activists. And what could we do if we knew about each other and we aligned our research and our thesis our theses and, and so forth. So myself and a team, and Dr. Rosalind Hampton, Sherry, Julianne, to name a few, oh my Sherry. We established the National Black Graduate Network and just did a connection of over the 300. It was 300 in the onset, developed this platform called www.nbgn.ca. And you can see it. There's a blog there with a Black graduate students. There's the research, the theses, thesis repository, um, message board. There's other aspects of ways to engage. And it's been, it's been a game changer. It's been a game changer personally for me as a passion project and as something that I think as a, it's a staple project for Canada and brought more broad. But I can't believe that when I started my undergraduate degree, I felt so isolated. And now I'm sitting in this meeting, like celebrating black graduate students and having the national black network. And so it's been amazing. So yeah, in regards to mental, mental health, it, I, I do think, and a lot of Black graduate students can maybe attest to this, the ostracization and the double layer of oppression, you know, being a lot of times the only Black graduate student in your class, mm -hmm. and then also that racialization aspect of not being given the same opportunities, it causes depression. It oh, causes definitely. loneliness. And okay. graduate school is already isolating. Like, yes. if you're like me, you're just in the library by yourself all the time. Well, now I'm just in my room by myself all the time because of COVID. <laughs> Um, so mm -hmm. this initiative was to bring voice, uh, connection and recognition and uh, cre create sustainable support for all the beautiful black graduate students and faculty mm -hmm. in Canada. Amazing. Thank you for that work. Thank you for, for I mean, you and your colleagues are creating that space. And you, I definitely think you hit it on the head and it's something we've touched on previously that, you know, grad school is isolating no matter who you are. Um, and it's just uh, so much more so uh, for black graduate students, I, be I believe it was my experience as well. Um, going over to Sean, you have a very um, multifaceted identity um, and, I, as we're speaking about, I guess, um, experiences if, as black graduate students, I think it's important that we hear about, about yours. And so um, you're an international student, you're a queer, queer person. Um, how, have, how has that, I guess, um, impacted your experience as a, as a graduate student? Yeah, so I mentioned earlier I'm from Barbados and the first immediate, I guess, reaction was, wow, there's not water around me all the time. <laughs> What's yeah. happening? It, right, landlocked. It was, it was really <laughs> strange. It was really strange. Um, and then also coming from um, a country where the majority of the, po of the population is Black, to where I'm now like the only black person in the room was also very weird. 
Um, so having to deal with that, and then on top of that, um, like coming to terms with my own queer identity, because Barbados is a very, um, it's a small island, it's quite conservative compared to, to Canada. So just coming to terms with, you know, who I am and, and what's okay, what's not okay, what's socially acceptable versus what's not, are two very different things um, from Barbados, like compared, comparing Barbados and Canada. Um, so there was a lot of navigation. There still is a lot of navigation, but um, really it was, it was quite isolating at first. You know, I remember the first person I ever told about my, my queerness, I was so nervous and shy, <laughs> you know, it was like, yeah. are they going to out me? I remember actually. So in Barbados, um, when I was preparing to come to Canada, um, there was a list of, of events for the welcome week that the School of Graduate Studies was was um, hosting. Mm -hmm. And there was one event that was for like people with queer identities. And I was so nervous to press register because I was like, <laughs> what if someone takes my photo and it gets back to Barbados or mm -hmm. something? Um, I was really nervous, but you know, I did it anyway to foster some kind of community. And, you know, I navigated my way through grad school, the more and more, like I became more and more comfortable um, to then co-producing an entire show um, in 2019, co-produced Science is a Drag. So we had scientists in drag um, perform That's their, cool. yeah. <laughs> so we performed, we did some type of lip sync or something and then spoke about our science right afterwards. It was, it was a free event, but we had registration and it sold out within 30 minutes. Oh like people really wanted science okay. drag who knew, <laughs> who knew? right um so yeah it was a lot of navigating to even get to that place of acceptance of myself um so there there were a lot of a lot of mental hoops and it definitely was not easy i think for me the what made it easy was having a supportive network of friends a supportive environment so um my lab um, as I mentioned, is we do research in the Black community and my supervisor, Dr. Juliet Daniel, she, she likes to recruit or she tends to recruit students that are Black, really. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, the lab sure. was very Black yeah. um, when I first joined and you know, it's diverse, but, you know, I yes, connected yes, yes. mostly with the black students and you know just being as close to them and feeling the support from them was was you know and other grad students as well was very very helpful for me and throughout the entire course of grad school um another thing that I did which I didn't really mention before um we didn't have like a black graduate network or anything at McMaster um so me and a few other friends we we co-founded the African Caribbean Graduate Student Association. So mm -hmm. bringing um, all the African and Caribbean students that are grad students together. And we host lots of events and stuff, you know, obviously halted now because of COVID, but that was another way in how um, I found community um, mm -hmm. in my earlier days of grad school. So, you know, community, really yeah. community, supportive environments really help, but yeah. otherwise um, I can't think of anything else really that really yeah. helped. Yeah, that's amazing. It's and the fact that you kind of sought that out and, and created that space for yourself and, and and for others, obviously, building community is so important. I really, really hope that I can attend uh, Science is a Drag at some point. Love me some drag. And what a crazy way to bring together all your it's such a clever way to bring together all your identities and do what you do. Like, please do let us know <laughs> the next time you host an event, you know, hopefully COVID um yeah. goes away at some point i'm sure it'll be just as well uh, attended so thank you for yeah. sharing that with us um yeah uh tara you're also actually an international student um and uh you are super active <laughs> in your community in halifax and so um i'm wondering how you how you balance it all um and how how has that impacted you as a human human being 
Well, I'd really love to sit on here and say, oh yeah, you know, I balance it really well. And here's all of the ways, that, here's all <laughs> of the tools that I use to manage my schedule. And look at me, I'm just so efficient and great. I'd love to be that kind of role model. The answer is I don't, right? Like the answer is to be frank, I don't. The answer is that I have a really hard time setting boundaries and saying no to people because I feel a sense of responsibility for people that I interact with because I feel a sense of responsibility for advocating for perspectives that I don't think are heard or understood. And at the same time, you know, I genuinely care about the work that I do and I, I like the, the subject that I work in. So I have a hard time balancing. I have a hard time figuring it out. Sometimes it makes me miserable. Other times I feel like I've got a, a, a decent handle on it. You know, uh, obviously the pandemic has created a context where at once you know it's never been easier to kind of sit down and just like be in front of a computer and try and work all day because what else are we going to do right. but at the same time it feels like nothing gets done mm -hmm. it feels like work is all encompassing it feels mm -hmm. like you can't breathe mm -hmm. in terms of like the broader and I, I recognize the salience of those words so I'm not going to use them in that way but you know, it just, it feels all encompassing in a way that I don't think is particularly healthy. Right. Um, and I think that if there's one thing that I would suggest, you know, for students who are looking to kind of find ways to be active in that community and also uh, to complete graduate school, I think it's being able to set firm and realistic boundaries mm -hmm. um, as for as to what it is you can offer and what it is you can reasonably manage uh, without feeling like, you know, to some extent you're going to fall apart because yeah. that that is a persistent a real feeling thing. sometimes. Yeah, for sure. It's a real, it's a real thing, especially if you, um, as all of you are doing, work for the community. Like it, it, with COVID, it's just a constant like go, go, go and man, to, to do that and then to, to somehow simultaneously feel maybe obligated would be very, very um, difficult. So um, boundaries are important and appreciate you bringing that up, Tari. Um, you also touched on COVID. So we're all here in this room because um, COVID, right? <laughs> like virtual meetings are the norm. And so I just wanna check in with our audience members and uh, switch over to poll question number two, please, Eli. Um, just asking, how is everybody doing? You guys have heard how our panelists are doing. Um, just checking on general feelings and mood, uh, especially given the pandemic. It's nice that I, I try to have these webinars in, in the middle of the day. I mean, if pe for people who, who have that ability to join, at least it's, it's sunny outside, it's getting warmer outside, but man, it has been an interesting uh, 14, 15 months. I don't even know how long it's been, to be honest. <laughs> Feels like it's been been ages. Um, Eli, how are we doing with the the poll? Pretty good. We're currently at eighty two percent. Okay, we'll give it another minute or so. Um, I personally, I th to try to take it day by day. Like some days I wake up and I'm like, what is even the point? <laughs> other days I wake up and I'm like, okay, like I have this task, let's do it. So. Um, yeah, it's been up, very up and down for me personally. Uh, so let's see the results here. Okay, most people are doing okay. And I'm glad to hear that. It's like, most people are doing okay, um, followed by surviving slash alive, which is <laughs> the, the, the feeling that we often uh, expressed here in this room. And um, nobody is doing better than ever, which I think is fair. And there's some people in the room who are doing not so great. And so um, to those people, I, I um, say that I understand. And I think all of us in the room have been there at some point and we're with you. And um, we hope that um, this conversation helps to, to let you know uh, that we've kind of been there and just to give you an idea of how, how we've managed. So thanks for, for responding to that poll. Um, so just moving, moving forward, talking about the pandemic and how it's affecting um, everyone. Um, thank you for that seamless transition, Tari. It's a very good point uh, about um, its impacts on the Black community specifically and its impacts on Black graduate students specifically. So I mentioned, you know, like um, I was alluding to the fact that my motivation has been waning, um, but I think that there's additional challenges for Black graduate students during COVID. And um, I'm hoping that you got you can pick up on that and express that each of you, I'll give you a chance. And so Terry, please go ahead. 
Yeah. Um, so it's something, this idea that, you know, the pandemic is more deeply experienced and, and, and more problematic, more challenging, more damaging for black folks um, in whatever profession they are is something that, you know, I, I have focused on and have thought about a lot. Um, it's something that I've written about quite a bit. Um, a piece came out last week on this topic. And as it relates to black graduate students, I think that there's a particular way that this is produced. And I think that that production is like, the university wants more from us, right? Um, there were more demands on black graduate students time because during the pandemic and also during what some are calling a racial reckoning, um, you know, the actual reckoning, I, I don't know who is doing it, but some are calling it a racial reckoning. Yeah. It, th that labor and that weight is being taken on by black graduate students who at once feel as if there's an opportunity or a space to explore or to articulate things that haven't been heard before. And at the same time are precarious are uh, are uh, being burdened with the with the responsibility to to kind of intervene in that space in ways that I think you know honestly folks need to do for themselves um, and so I've seen that happen I've seen the kind of strain and weight that that's placed on folks um, that you know in another world or in another time wouldn't necessarily be there so that's something that comes up for me mm -hmm, mm -hmm. thank you for that um, Sean or Jamila want to jump on or add to to that to those feelings, uh, your opinions on how uh, the pandemic is differently affecting Black graduate students. Yeah, first, Harry, congratulations on your piece. It's Yay! fantastic, fantastic. Mm -hmm. And um, I haven't written that much on black, the Black community and COVID-19, but I'm starting to write about the Black student experience with getting called by the university, getting demanded by the university to apparently fix all of their problems because we hold the key to an anti-racist university apparently, but without the actual sustainable structure to remunerate, uh, to recognize, to provide us a lot of time with, with a team, with a sustainable team to do the work. And also, I think it's also problematic, the view and the call to look at us and just be like, oh, um, you know, and I don't put anyone else, anyone out who's done this to me. I appreciate <laughs> all of you. But that call when they when people come to us and they're like, oh, I'm doing a I'm doing a speaker series on anti-black racism. Can you come and talk? And just the assumption that because I'm black, that is my calling or and because what happens is it, it creates an island for black graduate students, not only to feel like there's only a certain sphere of study that we're able and validated to do. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, so the, I, I, I hear it and I feel it. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Um, we spoke kind of about, I've, I've I always use alliteration because I'm so cheesy. So the expression I used was keeping up with Ken. And so I, we talked about, <laughs> we talked about the different ways that, you know, it's, it's a bit more challenging and the impacts on mental health. And so that expression, um, keeping up with Ken is to talk about maybe, you know, the, why it's a, why, getting to the heart of why it is a, a bit harder um, in the comparison to um, perhaps our, our, um, our, our white peers, you know, our white peers, our white colleagues. Um, Sean, did you have anything to, to say about that in particular? And I also open up to, to the other two. Yeah, I feel that a lot as like in science because there are not many of mm -hmm. us in science, first of all. Um, and it's really difficult to navigate that. Like I always feel as though I have to be like I have to be publishing in the highest impact or mm -hmm. I have to be putting in like 500% more work. Like I have to be doing all these extra things that my peers aren't because science is very white mm -hmm. and straight. Yeah. Right. <laughs> um, so it's, it's just always a weird feeling of mm -hmm. navigating that. And, you know, sometimes I put, more pressure on myself than I need to because a lot of the times w whatever output I have is good but in the back of my head it's like okay no I need I I, I have to be so yeah. 
that or like yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah so it's it's really it's been really difficult like, dealing with that i would say mm-hmm. yeah no i i i think that our our fellow panelists feel the same jamila Turi, anything to add um yeah, the first thing that I was thinking about when I when I think about the prototype kind of Ken white student is that we know that there is a lack of black faculty, a lack of black mentors to really and and just focus on developing the black graduate student experience and learning. But this moment is calling black students to teach the white students. So the prototype kind of Ken can sit back and just ride the wave of just le- getting all this richness and learning all these histories. And, you know, and I'm not saying the Ken has bad intentions, they're just learning. No, and right. what about the black students? We want to learn too, and we want to grow too. And we want that space for our education to be pluralized mm-hmm. and to be anti-racist and, you know, and right. why do we have to be the ones to, to, to do the work, to do, to do the work? Why? Yeah. The system, the university should already be, it should already be a part of the system, honestly. Right. Right. But it's not. And it's we're, not. Just, <laughs> we're just now getting to a point where maybe it's being thought about. Um, Terry, please go ahead. You were going to say something. Yeah. And just to add on to that, it's not as if any of the other obligations go away. Right. <laughs> like, so it's not as if yeah. like with all of these other responsibilities and with all of that other workload, the actual responsibilities that come with being a PhD student somehow evaporate. So then all of a sudden the question is, well, why haven't you done as much on your dissertation as this person? It's like, well, actually I was doing this, 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 and this. I had five different webinars. I asked <laughs> to do this. I did this. I da, 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 but none of that counts. No. Yeah. And I, at the end of it you know my my future is more precarious than the other person's is but at the same time what have i had to do in contrast with this other person right like it's those kinds of questions that really come up for me and i think that you know i I think that when we we reflect on mental health one of the worst things for our mental health is the feeling of comparison Mm. right Mm. feeling comparison and measurement and what this environment does is it produces this constant comparison. Like if I had the time that this person has, you know how much work I would get done? (laughs) If I didn't have to educate people about blank, do you know what I could do? Like, Mm -hmm. and those feelings, it breeds a certain form of resentment that Mm -hmm. ultimately kind of like is a bit corrosive Mm -hmm. um, and kind of really undermines progress um, in terms of just being able to feel okay uh, Mm -hmm. on a day-to-day basis from my perspective. Yeah. Wow. That is, yeah, you are definitely a writer. You guys are all definitely scholars. Just so, so well said, so well articulated about what that means and what the impact is. It's just um, that double consciousness that always thinking about yourself relative to the other person, yourself uh, as a black person and how people are viewing you, how you're giving back, how, but also trying to manage your own scholarship. It is, a lot. It is a lot of pressure, and and I think that does lead to to mental health challenges uh, for for people. I know it it did for myself in my PhD, and um, those those impacts they they are long lasting. It's not something that you you know you come out of your PhD you're gonna be okay. Like, <laughs> I mean, it's a lot better, but but that doesn't that doesn't go away right away. And so, um, that's that's a really good point, Jamila. Uh, you brought out brought up um, about uh, anti-racism efforts in the in the university. So as we had said, the Black Lives Matter movement, uh, you know, kind of um, came to a head last uh, so last spring, um, around about a year ago and during this time. And um, that kind of was the, I think, beginning of when universities started actually seriously talking about anti-racism and seriously talking about specifically anti-black um, racism um, and anti-indigenous racism and so my question here is um like how do you think it's going uh and <laughs> sorry's laughing how do you think it's going and what are your worries about what's happening what are your worries um about perhaps um how what things are maybe not happening i guess i'll say it that way um yeah. I can chime in here because I, I, I have some thoughts on this. Um, <laughs> you know, I think that there was a 
piece that came out in Bloomberg, if it wasn't two days ago, it was maybe three days ago. And it, the, the, I'm speaking about corporate America here, so we, we're talking different contexts. But I think that the example is indicative, right? They said that these corporations have pledged something like five or six billion dollars worth, and uh, please forgive me if I'm wrong on the funds, but I think the magnitude is the right one. Um, five or six billion dollars collectively, all these corporations had um, committed to all of these anti-racist initiatives, you know, committed to Black Lives Matter, to, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Right, right. And the actual amount that had been spent is something like 250 million, right? Like in other words, you know, yeah, it's <laughs> not looking great. <laughs> this reckoning <laughs> is all looking great. Um, and I mean, I think that broadly speaking, that kind of understanding could absolutely be translated to the academy, right? There's a sense that I think people want to feel as if they are doing good and they don't recognize that that feeling of doing good is A, not the same as actually doing good, and B, that doing good might take some sacrifice mm -hmm. and some discomfort. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not talking about having a conversation where you pray for absolution from the Black person who told you that they committed two microaggressions last week. <laughs> I'm talking about the transfer of resources, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> and so, I, you know, I, I don't, think that it's going very well. I don't think that universities are particularly well equipped to have uh, meaningful conversations and actually redistribute resources um, to address racial inequities, both within the university and outside of them. Um, and I think that more often than not, what ends up being produced is a form of tokenism where we ask the Black professor or the Black student to perform their pain um, such that you know, everyone can feel better about themselves. We pat ourselves on the back and we move along. Um, and that's a bit depressing to me. Yeah, no, that's fair. That's fair and, and definitely uh, hits it on the head. Like I, it's it's scary for myself personally. It's scary to, to know that like I've been part of efforts at um, my previous institution, University of Alberta. And I feel that these people, administration is well-intended, but I'm leaving and moving forward, like how how will how will the work that I and my my peers put in be taken up? Will it produce opportunities for people who are not in the room? Like that is my personal fear in these type of instances. So, um, Jamila or Sean, any any thoughts about uh, the movement that's maybe or maybe not happening in universities and how that's making you feel? Yeah, I really loved the what Tari was saying about performativity. And just when I'm looking at the history of how black bodies have been used and abused within North America, mm -hmm. it makes me think of this term that um, a couple of scholars have brought up called fungibility, that the black body is fungible. Its only value is as an object for someone else's use value. And you see it all over for entertainment and here in the university as a means of disruption. And so this is very problematic. And I, I'm not saying that it's like, we can't do anything about it, but what needs to be done is a structural systemic change. Um, and you know, it's interesting when people think of a structural systemic change, they go directly to policy, mm -hmm. but sometimes it comes from the ideology first. I read this very interesting book. It was called Me and White Supremacy, mm -hmm. written by a black woman. I'll put the link in the chat. It's awesome. No worries. Me and white supremacy. It's really good. I just started it. And I'm just going to say like the, the question that really got to me. She's speaking to a white audience and she says, you know, it's so often in this work, you know, white scholars are asking, what can I do? And she's like, you need to ask what has happened for you not to be doing something at this point when there is Google and when it was so funny. I was laughing so hard when there is Google and when, you know, BIPOC people have been saying it for so long. And she's like, don't take it as an insult take it as a real internalization, self-reflective moment. And so this self-reflection can go a long way to systemic change, but this self-reflection causes people to be so upset. And, and they, uncomfortable. Yeah. And uncomfortable. So then they stop the process right away. And then we're stuck mm -hmm. with just throwing black students around <laughs> the school. <laughs> <laughs> right. This is what it ends up being like. And I and that's such an interesting and, and uh, poignant point to bring up the reflection piece that is required from every single person. Like it's 
huge. It's important. And yeah, it's not, it's not necessarily an absolution and it's not necessarily like, what, what can we do? It's like, I think it's so much work. And I think the reflection oftentimes starts from how did, how did we get here? You know, like, how did we get here? And I hear about work that many black scholars have done, the work that um, um, is being done in, in the East coast about, you know, making known the history of uh, slavery and the direct connections to certain academic institutions. Like if you look, the, the information is there and it's not to make anybody feel bad. It's to get to a common reality, to be able to say, okay, this is what happens. And then after many generations, it has led to where we are now through a series of events. And so um, that personal reflection is an important and, and something that anyone can do. So thank you for bringing up that point, Jamila. Sean, um, thoughts? Yeah, so uh, yeah, McMaster, um, last year, they put out all of these big commitments, etc. cetera. Um, one thing that I would say that, that they have done and the like, movement or not, well, a few things, but sure. Sure. the major one, I think, is that they committed to do a cluster hire of Black faculty at Mac. So this, like across every single faculty, so humanities, mm-hmm. social sciences, sciences, et cetera. Um, and that has been moving forward as far as I understand, slower than I anticipated because it's basically a year after, mm-hmm. but you know, things are at least happening. And you know, a lot of our issues as black students, as Jamila noted and Terry as well, like we who do we have to look up to really, you know, mm-hmm. to help mentor us and guide us. Um, and I think this is a step in the right direction. Um, of course, why is it only happening now? Why didn't this happen before? Like, why mm-hmm. haven't all of these commitments been been at least in the pipeline before? Like, that's a bit very problematic. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, I'm at least happy about that small thing. Mm-hmm. But, you know, that's the thing with these universities, right? They try to give, like, little, little bits and pieces. So, okay, they're happy now. Like, give them another... <laughs> years and then they'll be upset about something else and we'll do something else and like mm-hmm. that's really not it <laughs> mm-hmm. that's not that's not no um and like universities have this this because universities are funded in s- such a weird way in that they have to try to not step on anyone's toes too hardly so yeah. when the cluster hire thing happened there were lots of other students who were like Oh, why isn't there like a cluster yes. or of like X club or X group? Yeah, right. Yes. Um, yeah, and there were lots of students that were upset about that. And I guess universities just don't really know how to handle, handle these situations. Um, and I've experienced that firsthand. So I was the graduate students. Mm-hmm. Um, association president for the last two years so I was really involved with the administration at the university Um, and I feel as though sometimes they mean to do well but they don't they just don't know how to I feel the same yeah and it's it's just really annoying because then they burden you or other um, other people in whichever community they're trying to please um, to they just overburden us, overwork us. And as Terry said, we still have to we still have to have our same outputs. I still have to finish my PhD by a certain okay. time. I still have to publish these papers by a certain time. And <laughs> <laughs> right, like it's not like like the universe just gives me an extra ten hours a day. Right, right. Yeah. So. Yeah. You know, like that has been very, very frustrating. I actually have a few requests for, you know, workshops, not workshops, but like speaking opportunity. Sure. And it's it's tiresome. Mm-hmm. It's honestly tiresome. It is. Um, and you can't just keep calling on the same people over and over and over. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. have you not learned anything? <laughs> <laughs> to, Jamila, to read your, your mics are unmuted. Please, uh, either of you, go ahead. Yeah, I was just gonna hop in and say, you know, saying that nothing's happened, and I, I, I back that, I would stand by that. It's not to invisibilize the labor of Black 
uh, Indigenous and other people of color, folks who are working within the academy to try and push for it to be a better space. Mm -hmm. It's to say that like they're doing, they're doing the bulk of that work. They're highly Mm under-resourced when, when initiatives do happen, they're typically short term. There's no real kind of backing or basis behind them. Right. And like fundamentally, I think a scholarship program here or a cluster hire there without meaningful means for sustainability and a commitment for a change in terms of the way that po- that the university's policies are produced and how they're implemented, it, it ultimately ends up being just a, a, a kind of like furthering onto the pile of the same kinds of dynamics and patterns, right? Like this is a dynamic issue. This is a pattern issue. This is not a person issue. Mm -hmm. Um, But at the same time, it's just this constant reproduction of the same issues um, and the labor that that puts on those very same people who are pushing um, for things to be different. It's, it's a hard thing to swallow. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Jamila. Now, what Terry said really what I was going to say, Mm -hmm. and I don't know anything else I was going to add. I think it was just the fact that when we're talking about the labor that's put on us and speaking for myself, it's like a difficult situation because as Terry mentioned before, there's a responsibility. Like, I feel like I cannot, I cannot go through the rest of my PhD without trying to find a way to create those sustainable structures or to figure out if if it's a possibility. Every day I ask myself how can this be sustainable? How can this not just be another conversation, another, you know, overburdened? And so it's a really, when we're talking about mental, mental wellness, I don't think anybody can take that away from us as black students, like that calling we have internally, that we have to do something about it. We can't, and there are some black students, bless their soul, who can just be like, oh, screw that. And I wish I wish I could be that way. But like for me and ma- many people that are in this act, advocacy, advocacy work, when we see the news, when we get that message, you know, last night, I know we have to move forward. Last night, I was like, okay, I'm going to relax. So I stayed up till five in the morning cleaning and that was my relaxed time. That was my self-care because graduate student, we relaxed after 1 a.m. <laughs> so that was my relaxed time. And in that time, I almost messaged two people about creating another initiative to fix this and this and this. And I had to stop myself. Yeah. So anyways, yeah, it's like, I don't know what to do about this. Who Who's going to help us with like that internal working? Do yeah. we need help with it? I don't know. Yeah, I think it's a a constant battle and reflection of how how we can step away and and make that space for ourselves and if it's a 1 a.m cleaning or a 12 p.m lunchtime bath or whatever it is like we we gotta keep trying to make that that space for ourselves and to to give give a a little bit of a break from from what is uh, all encompassing i think is what one of the words that was used so yeah i totally agree um, it's now 3 p.m. Eastern, 1 p.m. Mountain Time, and we are going to transition to our petition to prof segment of the the discussion. One hour flies by so quickly, um, but in this segment, I know, right? <laughs> it's, it really does. In this segment, we speak to a uh, Black professor, uh, faculty member, and uh, get their perspectives at the uh, about the topic at hand. So um, today we have Dr. Bukola Salami. Uh, Ellie, is she in the room? Or... Uh, I'm not sure. So I can't see them as an attendee or anything. So mm. I'll just assume that they haven't joined yet. Okay. So I will send her a note. And mm. in the meantime, I will ask our panelists a question <clears throat> about uh, boundaries. And we're getting back to boundaries again. Sorry. I know, I know the, the question, the question keeps coming up and the answer is like, I'm not really sure, but um, just trying to transition into something that is uh, um, hopefully helpful for Black graduate students in, in the room who are, are listening to us. Um, ha, what, do, what do boundaries look like for you? How do you create them? Um, I'm going to let you guys go ahead while I send this email. <laughs> I would love to be taught <laughs> because I'm not very good at it. Um, I would say that, you know, one of the things that I'm trying to learn is how to recognize what is my work and what is other people's. 
and how to be humble enough to recognize that sometimes it's okay to say that this isn't working or this thing is falling apart or you know, I can't do this thing, right? There's a certain sense that humility really needs to play a role. Um, and sometimes, you know, I, I've got a case of hubris, right? Oh, I can take this thing on. I can do that. I can, you know, if I just do this or if I do this in this way and it, it doesn't work out that way. And I, you know, maybe, I, you know, as much as it is certainly the role of friends, allies, and other well-meaning folk within the university to monitor themselves and monitor their asks. It's also my role to say, no, no way, no how. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm trying to figure out how to do that and do that in such a way that, you know, while respectful, it's firm and it's direct. Right, right. Do me yeah. I love that. Um, I've been doing that a little bit more lately, saying no. And because as a graduate student, a lot of these opportunities look good on our CV, like we're trying to, you know, increase our experiences. Um, and so sometimes when I say no, I'm worried, oh my gosh, like, will that opportunity come back? Or, But it's really being like, you know, that's okay, because my mental wellness is more important than this. So saying no 100% is like the best graduate student and black graduate student advice. And the second one is in regards to furthering what Sean says about building community, but even more like when you're called, especially as a black graduate student to do a talk, showcase your work, who else did it with you? Bring them to the table. Don't let yourself be tokenized. Like let yourself be recognized. You can do it by yourself, but also show that this is not just, oh, this is just like an exceptional, exceptional human being and no one else. No, this is a community effort. We are all sitting here uh, continuing efforts that our ancestors have done before us you know, and our elders and our parents have done before us and other activists have done before us. And we're just pushing pushing it along. We're not reinventing the wheel. And it does a lot to break that tokenism, uh, the tokenistic culture. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I completely agree with, with both of you, um, especially with saying no. Um, that's really hard. It's really, really hard to say no. Um, as Terry said, it's like, okay, you know what? I'll just dedicate a few hours to this. Okay, this, this is not too much time. I'll just do that too until it piles up. Like it, it's just too much to actually handle. Um, so acknowledging when to actually say no is very important. Um, and as Jamila, you know, I also want to reiter reiterate what Jamila said about bringing your community along with you. You know, so if you can't particularly do that talk or something, you have, you know, someone else that can speak to that maybe from a different perspective, a different lens. Um, I, like that's really important for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And just being honest, especially like with that, um, like the student supervisor relationship mm -hmm. as well, like just having, um, honest conversations with your not just a supervisor but your committee your supervisory committee etc because that is going to help you get through grad school with um with not too many tearful nights <laughs> <laughs> there will be some but not too, but not too many right not enough. too many but just enough tears just enough <laughs> <laughs> the perfect graduate experience just enough tears someone should uh copy copyright that um there's a comment in the chat here i'm just going to read it aloud um this is from Tariq youssef uh jamila you reminded uh, me of something by roxanne gay i went to i went and got the full quotation which says i'm trying to say no more and it's really hard Part of the challenge is that people are really resistant to hearing it. People sometimes see no as a challenge. They see no as this sort of call to arms. When I, when I say no, I actually just mean no. It's not an invitation. So in addition to learning how to set boundaries, I think the better question is, how do we teach people to respect boundaries? Thank you for sharing that, Yusuf. And uh, yeah, I don't know if any of you guys want to comment before we move on to the next question. Well, I just want to shout out Tarek, who's a close friend of mine and I didn't realize he popped in the chat. I love the I love the um I love the quotation. I think it's accurate. I think yeah. that, you know, different organizations 
um, and spaces want in a well-meaning way to add quote unquote a different perspective, right? Mm -hmm. And so they feel as if it is primary, it is of primary importance to add that perspective over and above the actual request of the person who's speaking to be like, no, actually this, this doesn't work for me, right? And so that tension as Roxane Gay articulates is an everyday thing. And that can, that can bleed into all kinds of spaces, particularly within the university where there's a structure that means that graduate students kind of fall towards the bottom, right? Where we're precarious, where there, are, there is a clear power hierarchy, where, you know, the, the word no resonates a bit less than if a professor said it, right? And so that, that, that really matters. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. I think that one thing I wanna uh, touch on before we go to uh, a little bit more in depth about advice uh, for others is, um, like that dynamic between students and supervisors and you guys are all students and going through it. And, and I, I, I don't ask to delve into the intricacies of, of those relationships, but um, you did bring it up, Terry, and I think it's an important point because um, more often than not, that can be a, um, an area of stress for students. I know it was for me. <laughs> it's something I'm still recovering from, but uh you know, th that relationship between students and supervisors, it's, it's always there, especially in graduate school, um, where you're relying on uh, this person, not only for mentorship, oftentimes it's for uh, funding and for approval for your next stage of, of your career. And that's any graduate student. And then you add the fact that um, more often than not, supervisors um, may not understand the, the challenges of being a Black student, um, or they may be perpetrating as, um, uh, you know, performing or, or, or doing uh, just, just racism, like just, they just might be racist straight up. And so, um, I, I don't know if you have any, um, ad advice, um, on how to navigate student supervisor dynamics, um, um, or if you've heard anything, um, from other people's experiences that you'd like to, any of you would like to share on, on the topic, um, before we move forward. Well, I think, student-supervisor dynamics are kind of the third rail of the graduate ex graduate experience, right? Yeah. But I, I think that thinking about that relationship as, as one would in another profession where it's a team and where there's kind of clear norms established and ways of engagement is a really important part of it, right? So how can we facilitate conversations that resonate and that like reflect everyone's realities within that space so that, you know, we know what those burdens are? Because I think, you know, sometimes supervisors may not even really fully understand the scope of it. They might not understand the reach of it. Um, and so having open conversations is really important. And I also think, you know, understanding that like mentorship can happen in different spaces and in different ways throughout the context of a university. And, in, and one of the key skills of navigating the university for a graduate student is understanding the different kinds of roles that different people can play within right. the context of your career and in your life, right? So your supervisor might play one role, someone else on your committee might play another, but another professor that you're engaging with might play another role and maybe those roles aren't the same or maybe they overlap. So, you know, those dynamics I think are really important to think about intentionally. Um, and I don't think enough is made when people get into graduate school about thinking enough about the, in, the, the intentional nature that's required to, for those relationships to go effectively. Yeah, definitely. Finding mentorship in, in different people, right? It doesn't all have to come from the same place. That is a very, I think, uh, relevant and important point. Um, Jamila? Yeah, I would further that and tell students to get out of their departmental bubble. I have a really great supervisor and I, I decided that, okay, supervisor is good for one aspect, that PhD rigorous, like, but uh, how about all my other, like my critical race, I started to build relationships in geography, in women's studies, all over. Mm -hmm. And it's it's very invigorating. It helps change your perspectives. And like, even if, like what I'm thinking about the graduate school experience, it's really important to nurture 
a bunch of different aspects. So that community work, that social work inside, like uh, building support systems. And you can do that when you get to different parts of the university, different departments, because they approach this differently. Sociology is like really rigorous and like very like kind of structured. Geography is more fluid. Women's studies is more activistic. So I recommend breaking out of that bubble and seeing what happens and just approach professors because I know students are so nervous. Just send that email, go to an event, walk up and be like, hello, I did that. My kind of names to be like, can we talk? It was really weird. It worked. Yeah, but... it does work. It does <laughs> it work. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Just reaching out to people. Um, yeah, I definitely want to to um, ask us to touch on that for for students informing um forming relationships and outlets inside of and or outside of the community and so um um sean maybe did you want to speak to that like i know you spoke a lot about creating interesting and, and really important spaces so um maybe you could touch on that a little um i actually wanted to go back to the supervisor <laughs> yeah, sure sure please anything please go yeah. ahead I wanted to reiterate what Jamila said. So that's that has also been my experience. Um, so my project, even though I'm in the biology department, it's not really a biology PhD. Mm -hmm. um, so I have two committee members that are biology, but the others are stats and epidemiology by and from like just different yeah. fields that aren't biology. Um, and that has really helped me as well because if I had an entire entire biology committee, my my project, I probably would have been forced to do more biology experiments that yeah. I didn't want to do or found useful. <laughs> sure. um, so you know, like having different perspectives, and you know, I from the beginning, well, maybe after comps again, after comps, um, I really formed like a really good relationship with my committee in general. I know I could, I could have knocked on their doors or emailed them at any time and said, Hey, can I run over this quickly with you? Um, that having that relationship is key for, um, a not so bad grad school experience. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> grad school experience. <laughs> is what I'm trying to say um and just being honest is always key for that relationship between your supervisors in general and you as well um I mentioned this before but I think I need to reiterate it again just uh, have difficult conversations if they need to happen and um if you need to have a third party then so be it but you're not going like it will be very difficult to move forward unless conversations are had however difficult they may be mm -hmm. um, so that that is my advice for graduate students right now um because I do I I know the struggle <laughs> the struggle um, is real yeah. struggle is as, as as president I I also um navigated a lot a lot of those difficult conversations for other graduate students mm -hmm. and their supervisors and you know, like it's, yeah, as I said, the struggle is real. So mm -hmm. yeah, have those open conversations. And I think we're going to go into another section now because we have our guest. <laughs> yeah, it looks like we have our guest. Yay. Thank you guys so much. I am very sorry about that. <laughs> That's okay. Life is crazy, right? Like it's a COVID time. I'm just going to do your introduction. So welcome, everyone. This is, um, let's welcome Dr. Bakula Salami, who is an associate professor of faculty of nursing at the University of Alberta. And her research program focuses on policies and practices of shaping immigrants' health. And she's been involved in around 60 funded research projects, 20 of which she has led. Um, she has led research on things like African immigrant child health, immigrant health, um, sorry, immigrant mental health, and the experience of temporary foreign workers in Alberta. And she has around 70 published articles in peer-reviewed journals, two book chapters, and eight reports. So that is the brief summary of Dr. Bukola. Salami, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. Um, yeah, we we're, we had an interesting and, and fairly engaging discussion of, of, with these panelists, uh, Terry, Jamila, and uh, Sean, about uh, what it's like for us to be Black graduate students, what, how institution is changing with respect to anti-Black um, and anti-Indigenous racism, and um, personally how we're managing. And so uh, as a professor, I would 
um, I guess, ask you, um, uh, how has, how has it been to be a professor during this time of change and how are you managing your mental health? And, um, do you have advice for, for black graduate students is really what I would say. Well, I, I think, um, I agree with you in terms of, um, the difficulties in, in managing our mental health, especially, um, of course, you know, physical distancing. And sometimes that, um, people translate that to social distancing, but, <laughs> um, I would um, say it should be physical, not social. Um, and um, that can create some um, challenges um, for um, graduate students. There's also issues related to the, um, the, to the connection that you would normally have, um, that you do not have. And, and that may be um, a challenge um, for um, many um, Black um, graduate students mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and other graduate students too. Mm -hmm, definitely. And how have you, I mean, I know that you've uh, helped to supervise a, a number of projects, um, some of which have, have touched on black, black mental health, um, uh, black youth mental health. And so um, as we're winding down, um, would you be able to talk about the takeaways uh, of perhaps that study and how graduate students in this room can, can learn from, from those, from that research? Yes. Um, so, so some of the um, the research that we've done about uh, mental health of Black youth um, indicate um, the vital um, influence of um, racism on, on um, Black people's mental health and how, um, you know, sometimes some Black youth um, not just um, experience the racism, but they internalize it. Mm -hmm. And sometimes the racism that they've experienced, you know, while growing up, um, you know, continues to affect them even now in terms of, um, so for example, there is a there was um, 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 there was a nice quote by um, uh, um, black um, youth about how she was always um, um, teased about her lips um, while um, she was um, growing up, and she still, um, you know, that still affected her um, even now, and um, she's internalized it. Mm -hmm. So um, there's also the issue about academic mm -hmm. and the academic struggle, mm -hmm. and also issues related to, um, you know, intergenerational tensions. Um, in terms of, um, you know, dealing with racism, um, dealing with uh, mental health, many um, Black students um, use um, um, spirituality, um, which um, is good. And many also um, use music, um, mm -hmm. which is, um, is a, a good source. But at, at the same time, there are some that also rely on um, self-imposed um, isolation. Mm -hmm. um, um, and um, so, so there are positive ways and there are also ways that may not be as, um, as um, great in terms of um, dealing with, um, with um, one's mental health. Right. So um, I would say I'm um, seeking positive strategies to um, deal with it. And I would say, you know, many uh, graduate students also talked about um, their peers and the influence of their peers and talking um, with um, your peers. I think I was reading something lately that said, you know, in the struggle as a black graduate student, that you need to have a body as you're going as you're going through through the, st the struggle. Someone that you can actually talk to, someone that you can, um, you know, talk things through. Because I remember, as a graduate student, especially, um, you know, one of the challenges that you know I faced was um, it wasn't um, as bad when I was um, in my first two years because I was taking courses. Mm -hmm. I had people that I could connect with. But when it was time for, you know, the, you know, writing, um, you know, the, the time when, you know, you're not taking courses when you're writing your dissertation, the worst thing for me was just, you know, having to proofread that dissertation by myself yeah. over again. And sometimes it's just good to have that connection and people that you can actually bounce ideas by. Um, and some of those people you may, you know, over time, and um, even, you know, when you're, um, a professor, you may still rely on them. Um, you may still draw on them um, for, for support, um, you know, um, long after you've um, completed um, um, graduate studies. Um, and I would say, you know, um, you know um, involvement in extracurricular, involvement in Black graduate student associations mm -hmm. and Black graduate student groups Mm -hmm. may also be important um, to really be able to draw on and find that um, collective identity mm -hmm. and um, a positive aspect of um, one's identity. 
That's amazing. Yeah, we definitely talked about that um, as a group here um, before you arrived. So it's it's good to hear that that affirmation and re- reinforcement of that that idea that community is important and necessary and is a a very um, useful tool in in mental health and and um, feeling feeling whole. Um, yeah. It's useful in, in we, navigating the issue. We did, we did an analysis once. Um, I did a research once to look at um, the influence of. Um, diverse social determinants of health on the mental health of um, immigrants versus non-immigrants. And um, what we found that was the strongest influence on our mental health was students, no matter how much we manipulated our data, was community belonging. Mm -hmm. So people feeling like they belong to a community Um, and um, also um, community belonging and um, um, income um, was a vital influence. And the good thing is, um, you know, of course, income is more difficult in terms of shattering, um, but, um, you know, community belonging is something that is very, very amendable to um, to um, social intervention. And we interviewed immigrant service providers to find out about, um, you, know, um, you know, issues related to community belonging. And people talked about the fact that, um, you know, when people try to belong, they first try to belong to people that, you know, are... Um, of similar backgrounds, so such as um, Black, because a lot of, you know, the broader community um, is not um, accepting mm-hmm. of um, Black um, populations. Um, mm-hmm. um, um, and then um, the other thing is, um, you know, when we asked about, um, you know, strategies to promote community belonging, they talked about natural environments. Um, so, you know, some of the natural environments is, you know, maybe there is a conference, the Black Graduate Student Conference mm-hmm. or something. It's, you know, you're going there, but but then there's also, you know, other things that you're gaining from that in terms of feeling like you're part of a community That's and connecting to other people. Um, so um, so yeah. those are some of the ways, um, you know, to, to um, deal with um, one's mental health. Thank you so much, Dr. Salami. Really right in the nick of time, lots of knowledge dropping on us. Uh, thank you so much. And so before we go away, we have one question here from uh, an attendee. I hope they're still present. Um, Kristen Senior says, hello, on the topic of uh, graduate, uh, on the topic of graduate student uh, supervisor relationships, I guess, I'm wondering if the panelists have any thoughts on the role of institutions or administration in training um, or otherwise supporting supervisors to learn how identity traits can compli- complicate the graduate experience. I've sat on a lot of conversations around how it's the supervisors who are already the most informed, who, who attend additional training, et cetera, so it feels like a topic administration administrations are really stuck on how to address. So um, any thoughts, guys? Sean? Yeah, so this is actually something that we talked a lot about well, specifically at McMaster. So at the GSA, we, um, well, actually, CAIGS um, mm-hmm. had, had, I think it was in 2016 or 2017, um, there was conversation there about student supervisor relationships and they released some student supervisor guide mm-hmm. um, that the student will fill as well as the supervisor at the beginning of the grad school experience. And then they will, you know, throw their grad school journey. They'll, you know, chat about things that might change, things that um, chat about, you know, what this document says and what's actually happening in reality yeah. and you know where things can change if there's wiggle room etc um but it wasn't mandatory at mcmaster and one of the things that at, at least at mac that we've been pushing for at the gsa was to make it mandatory for the supervisor and the student to fill out this it's like an eight page it's very comprehensive mm-hmm. um and it's not a contract but it, it keeps both parties accountable to each mm-hmm. other um so even before this form was was generated me and my supervisor did something similar we sat down and we set out expectations so we are both accountable to each other throughout our mm-hmm. grad school journey um so i think there is that's a very long way to answer the question but i think there are um that there, there's a motion at the moment um at a higher institutional level mm-hmm. um, to address these these issues and actually have something that is <clears throat> like have a living document that you can edit and, and see fit as time goes by. 
Um, and if your institution doesn't have that, um, I think you should push for that or just have a discussion with your own supervisor or your department and say, hey, can we do something like this? Right. It, you know, it really helps the grad school journey. I think so too. I think so too. Tari, did you have a thought? I was going to suggest exactly that. So <laughs> I, I couldn't have put it any better myself, but I think that that should be made mandatory at an institutional level so that people can actually um, be held accountable to things on both sides. Yeah, amazing. Okay, I think that I think that that's it. I mean, what a what a f- um, fast and quick ninety minutes. It always it always feels like that when we start to get into it. And I, I hope that everyone here learned something today. I'll thank you all, uh, the panelists, uh, Dr. Salami, Jamila, Sean, and Tari. Thank you so much for for being here and for being honest um, with with your experiences. Um, and yeah, I think that this is the end of the discussion because it is 1.30 my time, 3.30 your time. And I know you guys are all busy. So thank you again. And um, we will be uh, doing episode four in the fall. I'll be taking a pause on the webinar series to, to get my life together and to make sure that we revamp and come back energized um, for, for the new uh, academic year. So Thank you all so much and have a great afternoon. Thanks so much. Bye, Bye everyone. Guys. Thank Bye. you. Thank Bye. You so much. Bye. 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 Bye.